1867. The Tokugawa dynasty stands upon failing legs. An invincible samurai, Kenshin Himura, walks the path of death and destruction, ushering in a new regime. Hated and feared by many, he is known as Hidukiri Batosai, the Manslayer. In retribution for his deeds, he has taken an oath to protect the innocent and never kill again. But old memories seldom fade, and bad habits die hard. Come. What are you, another one of these samurai? Uh, I wasn't finished speaking. Roroni Kenshin premieres Monday, March 17th at 6.30. Only to Ami. I still think there's something really special in that intro, and I adore it despite everything that's happened. Roroni Kenshin was my favorite anime, and it helped shape me into the person that I became. Kenshin aired alongside shows like Dragon Ball Z and Gundam Wing and the Toonami After School Bot, and that's where I was first exposed to it. It was honestly my first real anime. The show's themes run a little bit darker than traditional shonen by layering lessons of self-acceptance, revolutionary atonement, and moving on from the past on top of the traditional ideals of self-growth. Kenshin was something beautiful to me, and I'd like to explain why that is, alongside the reasons that it hit me the way that it did. I think that understanding that makes everything that happened with its creator all the more depressing. The story and themes of Roni Kenshin are built upon tragedy. The man known as Kenshin Himura was reborn in the aftermath of a bandit massacre and was trained to be a swordsman from a young age. After identifying with the ideals of the Tokugawa Revolution, he abandons his training to become an assassin. Years of killing change Kenshin from an idealistic youth to a stoic murderer, hands stained with the blood of revolution. During this period, Kenshin meets the woman who would become his wife and slowly begins to recover his emotions. Near the end of the revolution, Kenshin is attacked by a group of assassins and accidentally kills his wife in a fit of bloodlust. This murder is the catalyst that creates the Kenshin we see throughout the rest of the story. Sworn to never kill again, Kenshin wanders the Meiji era looking to use these skills to aid the weak and the downtrodden. This leads him to the crux of the story where he must balance the weight of his past alongside a new life among the friends he's made as a wanderer. The lessons of Roroni Kenshin are ones of acceptance and personal growth. While he may grow as a swordsman throughout the second arc of the story, Kenshin's breakthroughs come from learning self-acceptance and to value his own life. The best example of this can be seen during the same arc in which Kenshin is forced to complete his training as a swordsman to stop the overthrow of the Meiji government. Kenshin spends weeks training in the mountain to discover the final technique until challenged by his master. Leading up to the clash and facing a certain death, Kenshin accepts that he's afraid to die. The revelation that his life has meaning empowers him to overcome his mental limits and master his style. Kenshin's final technique isn't fueled by anger, nor is it ever presented as a power fantasy. The final technique of his school, an ultrasonic sword draw, is the manifestation of Kenshin's newfound will to live. Roroni Kenshin is built upon the themes of self-acceptance, learning to love yourself, and overcoming your anger. And these ideals saved my life as I worked to overcome my own issues with anger, self-worth, and depression. To understand that, I need to give you a little bit of context about myself. So, I was an overweight, effeminate boy growing up in rural Tennessee when Kenshin first aired. My dad, worried that my effeminate ways were early signs of me being gay, constantly pushed me towards more aggressive, manlier hobbies. He was raised in a home of toxic masculinity, and honestly, he still struggles to convey his emotions outside of anger. On the other side of the coin, my mom was, and honestly still is to an extent, a little bit overbearing, and was worried that I was using escapism to f hide from my problems. The mix of a vitriolic father and an overbearing mother culminated into a real nasty cocktail of anger issues, and those issues were only exacerbated by the bullying problems I dealt with at school. Kenshin hit me at a time where I needed positive representation of learning to live with my anger, and his struggles helped me identify mine. I spent a lot of time trying to track down the Kenshin DVDs in the period between middle school and graduation to minor success, but it wasn't until post-graduation that I started to reintroduce myself to the show and honestly came to understand the more prominent themes of the show. After graduation, I was gifted a laptop and learned how to torrent anime. You know, as you do. Naturally, Kenshin was the first thing I came back to, and for the longest time, it was the show I watched every year around my birthday. 
The show helped me through my first Christmas alone when I didn't want to be around the toxicity of my family, especially in the wake of my parents' divorce. Hell, one of my fondest memories is the New Year's week spent building Gundam model kits with my best friends while Kenshin played in the background. So the opening track is localized and really poorly sung in English for the American release. So at the start of each episode, we'd race just to skip past it. The show stuck with me in a way I can't really explain even despite all this, and my best friend still openly admits that, you know, Seth lived and breathed Roni Kenshin for his entire life. Sadly, this all comes to an end around November 2017 when the news broke overnight that Watsky had been arrested. According to a series of articles by Kotaku's Brian Ashcraft, Nobuhiro Watsuki, the creator of the hit manga Roroni Kenshin, has been charged with the possession of child pornography. Yomiuri Shinbun, a Japanese newspaper, reported that investigators had discovered DVDs that showed nude girls under the age of 15 at Watsuki's home and office. When interviewed by the authorities, Watsuki is on record of saying that, I liked girls from the upper grades of elementary to around the second year of junior high school. Due to the backlash of these allegations, the newly airing arc of Kenshin was put on indefinite hiatus. In February, Nikon Sports reports that Watsuki was fined what amounts to $2,000 for violating Japan's child pornography laws. In April, Jump Square announces that Kenshin will resume publication in June alongside a statement from the editorial staff. The statement reads, The author spends his days reflecting and with remorse. We think as though it's our obligation as a publisher, as well as his as an author, to make a way for us to reply through the work of various opinions we've been getting. And so, from the July issue, serialization will resume. In June, Kenshin returns from hiatus and is featured in Jump Celebrations later that year, along an appearance in the Jump Force video game. And with that, the show just goes on. So, I spent a lot of time in reflection after that news came out. I did my best to air my frustrations amongst trusted company, and, and hearing my peers express their frustrations created a catharsis and solidarity that I wasn't alone. There's a tweet from Manofsky article, he's a Twitter user that I look up to who dissects manga, and that helped me better contextualize the severity of Watsky's actions. The realization that my money had indirectly funded the sexual exploitation of children hit me really hard as I ran over his thoughts. Those words sunk every mental attempt I had to reconcile my feelings with the series as something independent of the author's crimes. Just talking about Watsky's work after that felt wrong and uncomfortable. I spent a lot of time wondering if I could even finish this because, honestly, even shining a negative light on Watsky's work was still shining a light on it. After a certain point, I just needed to get my thoughts collected somewhere, and hopefully by putting myself out there with this, I can help someone deal with this issue in the way that Manofsky helped me. I've talked to a couple of friends who were able to go back to the show, and their reasoning just never sat right with me. The two ideas that I keep getting floated are to either go anime only, or to separate the art and the artist, but honestly I think both are pretty flawed. Anime, well, having minimal input from the creator, is still a representation of the characters and the plot that Watsky created. While I've never been really fond of the idea that you can separate an artist from their art, manga is one of the unique mediums that is the sole vision of a single creator. I cannot divorce Kenshin from Watsky because despite being something beautiful and heartfelt and loving, it's still a direct representation of him as a creator. I don't begrudge anyone who can take the series as a compromised work, especially since I'm on the record of doing that with the Persona games, but the sexual exploitation of children is a line in the sand I just can't bring myself to cross. I've come back to this topic numerous times, and I realized that the lessons that Roroni Kenshin taught me would never let me divorce Watsky's crimes from it. Watsky is not repentant for his actions, nor was he really held accountable for them. The fine he received was a slap on the wrist, and he went back to work almost immediately. I really think that if Watsky was repentant, Kenshin would have died there with him as he exiled himself. In 2019, Moroni Kenshin reads as a lecture on morality and redemption from a hypocrite who isn't interested in either. Watsky is an unrepentant monster, and while the burdens of his actions are relatively minor for fans like me, the children that he harmed through his habits will be surrounded by the imagery of his work for the rest of their lives.
I spent a lot of time in the aftermath looking for shows and things to fill the whole kitchen left in my heart. There was a rush of recommendations on Twitter for the shows that were thematically similar to Kenshin, but each one of them rang really hollow to me. While I enjoyed shows like Trigun and Tsukakage Ran, honestly I did them a disservice by trying to use them as replacements instead of works of their own. In the years since Watsuki was outed, I came to terms with the gap in my heart and the disillusionment I had with his work. So normally I'd be spending this time preparing for my yearly rewatch, but instead now here I am, saying goodbye to Baroni Kenshin. Howdy y'all. First off, I'd like to thank everyone for making it to the end of this. This has been a long-running passion project for me, and seeing it through to completion means the world to me. So I'm greatly appreciative for anyone who stuck around and watched the end of this. That being said, I do want to go ahead and get some thank yous and cite some of my sources before I leave, especially since this video kind of ends on a downer. First off, I'd like to go ahead and thank Manovsky article. Manovsky is probably my favorite Twitter user, and a lot of his content is probably what made this video possible. Manofsky's insight on manga and his general leaning towards living with empathy are what made this video come together and he's been a wonderful inspiration on me. Alongside Manofsky, I'd also like to thank slash credit both Twitter users at Bunny Cartoon and at Silence Drowns. Both of them were very receptive and helpful right after the news about Watsuki came out and both recommended the show Sukakage Ron which, as you've seen in this video, makes up a majority of the background. At Bunny Cartoon runs the Anime Nostalgia Podcast, which the Miami Mike episode helped me get through the editing portion of this. Silence Rounds runs a really good Twitter about cosplay, as well as some pretty nice cats. Lastly, I'd like to thank some people very close to me in regards to this. First off, I'd like to thank my younger sister Shelby for doing the art for the thumbnail of this, as well as encouraging and supporting this project and honestly helping make it a fruition. That girl means the absolute world to me, and I'm blessed to have someone so talented as my sister. Alongside her, I'd also like to thank my friends Emily, Polahoko, Aishan, Speedball, The Dark Id, Lab, Indestructible Cat, and Cholafoot for being here, checking out some of the more rough first drafts, as well as just being supportive through this. Lastly, I'd like to thank both Stuart Vita Hanrata and Ryan St. Cola Collins for helping with the direction of some of the later takes, as well as helping me with the editing and further revisions of the original script. You can find Ryan over at underscore Saint Cola on Twitter, where he writes a lot of fighting game news. Stuart, I believe, hasn't really made his venture back to Twitter, but he is my son and I love him. With that being said, I'm going to walk away. I don't, I don't really know if there's going to be something after this, but I hope that if there is, you'll follow me through it. Have a good night, everybody.